Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and this is the breakdown of One Division's episode 8 at point of epic speed. First things first, please know there's gonna be some huge spoilers in this video. Now please spare me just 40 seconds to thank today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription-based streaming platform that exclusively shares documentary and non-fiction TV series and movies. There are tons of award-winning exclusives and originals. It features 35 collections of curated programs, handpicked by their experts. There are thousands of documentaries and non-fiction TV shows on a variety of different topics, such as history, nature, science, travel, and so much more. And streaming is so easy, you simply log in through the app or your browser to enjoy content anytime, anywhere. And if you sign up using my code, the Canadian Lad, you'll get an entire year subscription for only $40.99. I can't stress enough how great of a deal this is for the amount of content available on Curiosity Stream. So episode 8 begins with Marvel playing a little bit with their intro, as it slowly turns purple to incorporate the origin story of Agatha Harkness. We see two other witches dragging Agatha to what I believe is her trial, because apparently she stole knowledge and practiced magic that is well over her age and station. So as a punishment, all the witches start shooting some sort of blue magic, and I'm assuming they're out here to kill her, therefore the name Salem, Massachusetts. It creates a parallel between Agatha Harkness and Doctor Strange. Both of them learned more than they should have. One got punished for it and the other became the master of the mystic arts. Now in the comics, Agatha Harkness settled in the English colony of Salem, Massachusetts. She formed her own coven of witches, hoping to freely practice magic in the new world. Now notice, as soon as this blue magic begins to turn purple, it not only changes color, but her witch outfit also turns into purple. Or in other words, as soon as Agatha's inner power start to protect itself, it also changes her witch costume. This scene ends with Agatha killing all of the witches, including the leader aka her own mother, by literally sucking the life out of them. And notice, as soon as these witches die, their face becomes desiccated, meaning they have been living for centuries. So when they die, their real form appears. Agatha then takes this brooch from the dead body of her mother. So despite the fact that she literally just killed everybody, deep inside she may still care for them. So maybe to keep something that would remind her of her mother, she took this brooch. Which brings us to Agatha's dungeon where we previously ended the last episode. And apparently she's able to communicate with her rabbit, clearly indicating this might not just be a rabbit. Now notice Agatha acknowledges that Wanda cannot read her thoughts. My thoughts are not available to you, tuts. So don't go giving yourself a migraine. So don't go giving yourself a migraine. This actually explains why Billy said Agnes was quiet on the inside. Because Billy wasn't able to read Agatha's mind just like I theorized in my previous breakdown. Wanda asks in her original accent, where are the twins? And Agatha kinda mocks her for this. Where are my children? That accent really comes and goes. Wanda tries to use her magic and bring down Agatha, but nothing happens, because this dungeon has runes all over the place, protecting itself from basic spells. And that's why Agatha made sure Wanda goes in the basement, because there she will be able to confront Wanda without getting kicked out. But Agatha constantly keeps asking Wanda, how does she not know the fundamentals of witchcraft despite being one of the best witches herself? But Wanda doesn't really know that, does she? I'll explain it in a few minutes. Agatha then admits about fake Pierre as well, that it was actually her who sent him in the first place. Agatha really wants to know how Wanda managed to do all of this, and that's why she sent Pietro, whose mission was to find out how Wanda created the Hex. So this fake Pietro, who she calls Pietro, is not really a villain. By the way, one of my subscribers said this could be a reference to the Beatles' Paul is dead theory. Paul McCartney had a car accident in 1966, and after that he looks different. The Beatles fans started to theorize that Paul may have died in that accident and have been replaced by somebody else. Fans called the fake Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney, and in one division, the fake Pietro is called Pietro. Agatha then takes the cicada that we've talked about in the previous breakdown, but she uses it to showcase to the audience what mind controlling really looks like. But here comes the first biggest moment of this episode. Agatha mentions transmutation. And of course, there's transmutation. This is the first time mutation or mutants have been mentioned in the MCU. And she says Wanda has been casting a spell even miles away at the edge of Westview. Here she's talking about all these people who are literally frozen at the edge of the town. By the way, this bunny is eating a whole bird? There's no doubt anymore that this rabbit is more than what it looks like. Agatha then makes Wanda relive her past memories, quite literally, so that she can know what drove Wanda into this madness. And how did she manage to do it in the first place? So I don't think we could have gotten the origin story of Wanda in any 
any better way than this. This felt just perfect. Anyway, we see the parents of Wanda and Pietro for the first time. Now notice the DVDs that we can see on the briefcase are I Love Lucy, Bewitched, and Malcolm in the Middle, all of which that have made substantial impact on Wanda. Therefore, the sitcoms. For her, the perfect life alludes to those sitcoms, because she had been living in a war zone, seeing brutal murders and bombing. So for her to be able to laugh seeing a family sitcom, her innocent mind took that for real, and in future that indeed becomes her reality. Anyway, so this is probably the year 1999. We know this because Wanda was born in 1989, and her parents died when she was 10, so that makes it 1999. But Malcolm in the Middle hadn't come out until early 2000, so either she was almost 11 when she lost her parents, or this is a slight continuity error. But you know what? The quality that the show produces every week, I shouldn't even be talking about continuity mistakes, so moving on. Now I found another detail in this scene. Notice how significantly more intelligent Wanda is compared to her rest of the family. For example, young Pietro didn't know what the word shenanigan means, but Wanda not only knows it, but explains it perfectly. Shenanigan is like a problem, but more silly than scary, but can sometimes be a little scary. And in the next scene, we come to know that Wanda always had her power. The bomb made by Stark Industries didn't go off not because it was defective, but because Wanda used the probability hex to turn the situation in her favor. Remember, she's yet to get entangled with the Mind Stone. So how was she able to stop this bomb from going off at such a young age? Because she was probably born with her powers. The Mind Stone may have just enhanced that. Okay, so why am I saying all this? What does being more intelligent and powerful have to do with anything? Well, I think Wanda might have been adopted. And these are not not her biological parents. Now, I wouldn't know for sure whether Marvel will go for the storyline and make Magneto her actual father, which would explain all this chaos magic. But what I do know is, if she in fact is born with powers, then she must have gotten it from her parents. Young Wanda continues to watch the Dick Van Dyke show, and it looks exactly like the one we've seen in the first episode. This at least answers one of Jimmy Woo's questions. Now we know why the sitcoms, how it literally shaped Wanda while she was growing up. But then, boom, an explosion goes off and everything turns dark, which presumably killed both of her parents. So what we've been told in Avengers Age of Ultron, we are finally seeing it on screen. And then comes this missile made by Stark Industries. Wanda, get in! This flashing red light and this beeping noise both got stuck in Wanda's head, which we got to see in the form of this commercial. So most of our theories were correct. This commercial was in fact Wanda dealing with her PTSD. Now notice when young Pietro heard some voices, he thought maybe those people came to help them. But Wanda's natural response was more pessimistic. Or maybe she was just being realistic. Whatever it is, it differs from Pietro. So we learn from this scene that Wanda, since a very young age, would rather be anything but optimistic. That's just not her game. Now imagine someone like her has powers like this and you take everything away from her. Would you expect her to behave normal and accept everything? Young Wanda then catches the Dick Van Dyke show still playing on the TV. But notice the character of Dick Van Dyke aka Rob says something twice that might have just foreshadowed the real villain behind the show. Oh, what a nice this isn't the first time we hear the word nightmare in WandaVision. We have seen fake Pietro mention it and even director Tyler Hayward. It's a pretty big leap from giving people nightmares and shooting red wiggly woos at you. We take her out, this whole nightmare ends. All of this might just indicate that Nightmare will be the real villain behind all of this. I'm not only talking in terms of WandaVision, but in the long run as well. He could play a vital role in phase four. Then young Wanda slowly extends her hand, but Agatha pulls her out. We come back to the present day Wanda, who's still unaware that she used the probability hex in order to stop the second bomb from going off. In the comics, these probability hexes were indeed the first manifestation of Scarlet Witch's mystical powers. So the fact that this massive explosion that took the life of her parents, who were sitting only a few feet away from them, but didn't even make a scratch on her body, and then a second piece of bomb didn't even go off while constantly beeping, despite the fact that Stark Industries was the leading brand in making weapons. Why would they make something defective? All of this point towards just one thing, which is Wanda has been a witch since she was born. Wanda and Agatha Harkness go to the Hydra facility, where the experiment took place. Even thinking of this memory makes Wanda extremely scared, but poor Wanda had to experience it again. And notice what Agatha says here, that really shows she's beyond all this politics and personal vengeance. Your reaction to the bombing of your civilian apartment building was to join an anti-freedom terrorist organization. We wanted to change the world. 
if she was the real villain here. Wanda joining the anti-freedom terrorist organization wouldn't have mattered to her. The fact that Agatha also thinks this was a wrong decision by Wanda goes to show she might have a good side hidden beneath this witchy persona. We then see how Wanda got her powers enhanced through the Mind Stone. One of the scientists says that no other candidate survived this experiment, but because Wanda is not just a regular human being, she made it through. Now why and how Pietro did it? I don't have a definitive answer yet, but let me know what you think regarding Pietro and how he might have survived being entangled with the Mind Stone. My theory is, Pietro was the first victim of Wanda's transmutation abilities. While they were stuck in the rubble for two days, she must have unknowingly also affected young Pietro. And that's why years later in the Hydra experiment, Pietro also came out alive. And look at how Wanda attracted the Mind Stone, whereas it should have been the other way around. And as soon as Wanda came in close proximity to the stone, the stone set itself free from the scepter, almost as if it wanted to empower Wanda. We learned in Infinity War that the stones have a life of their own, and they pretty much can decide who they want to empower and what not. And then comes what I think is the biggest moment of this episode. Wanda sees her future self, and we officially get a glimpse of Scarlet Witch in the MCU. We only get to see her in silhouette though, but the shape of the costume and headdress certainly look like a version of the uniform that Wanda herself has worn in the comics mixed with the uniform we've seen her wear in the MCU. And yes, just now, someone on Twitter has actually enhanced this photo that we've only seen in silhouette. Honestly speaking, this looks amazing. But notice this entire experiment was being recorded, but later the scientists see that the footage has been crippled. It's crippled exactly the way we saw it happen in Westview. Yes, I know what you mean. So if you let's allow me to go a bit crazy, then I'd propose a very crazy theory here. I think the future version of Wanda, aka Scarlet Witch herself, enhanced Wanda with the Mind Stone. And she's the one who cut this moment from the footage. Because according to the footage, the Mind Stone never left the scepter. Wanda never even touched the stone. She just simply fell on the ground. And for those of you who may think the scientists didn't even see it happening, well, they did. Here we can clearly see they're both looking at the light coming off of the Mind Stone. They clearly saw everything that happened, and that's why they found it even more strange that it's not there in the footage. Agatha forces Wanda to revisit more of her memories, which takes us to the first ever actual conversation between Wanda and Vision. But remember in Civil War, Vision just randomly enters Wanda's room and Wanda says we talked about this? Viz. We talked about this. So when Wanda said we talked about this in Civil War, she meant this incident that we can now finally see in WandaVision. I apologize. I don't mean to intrude. I mean, what else can I say here? We hear dialogues here and there, and years later, Marvel decides to make another scene connected to that. Isn't this why Marvel is so good at what they do? I mean, be honest, when you watch Civil War, did you ever think that one day we'll get to see what Wanda really meant by saying we talked about this? No, but Marvel still decides to make a callback to that scene, and that's just brilliant writing right there. And notice Wanda and Vision were watching Malcolm in the Middle, and the scene Marvel specifically used here might be a reference that Wanda's reality is breakable. Now, keep in mind, this is post Age of Ultron, so Wanda just lost Pietro and she's incredibly sad. Vision comes to her so that she doesn't feel alone and asks her to share her feelings. So he said the fact that Wanda can cry over her brother's death, that's also a feeling many people can't have, even if they want to, meaning himself. He says, But what is grief, if not love persevering? That's just as beautiful as it gets. Now here's a very subtle detail here. When Wanda lost her parents, she still had a brother to look after. And when he was gone, she had Vision supporting her whenever she needed. But when the wave came again and this time took Vision away from her, that's just a final nail in the coffin. There's nobody there anymore who will help Wanda except her reality. No Cap, no Tony, and no Black Widow. Cut to the last piece of her memory. We visit the Sword's headquarters. Wanda strongly asks to see the Vision's body and that she's here to take it back because Vision at least Liz deserves a funeral. Director Hayward lets Wanda in and allows to see for herself what a big waste it would be to bury a three billion dollars worth of vibranium on the ground. But Hayward really shows his true colors here. He's the one who planted the idea that Wanda should just bring Vision back online through her magic. Not everyone has the kind of power that could bring their soulmate back online. Forgive me, back to life because Wanda was genuinely there to take Vision's body and bury it. But it was Hayward who made her realize that with her power, she can easily bring Vision back to life. He straight out lied to Wanda by saying this. We're dismantling the most sophisticated sentient weapon ever made. 
No, he wasn't only dismantling it. In fact, till today's episode, he has been actively working to bring Vision back. Precisely another version of Vision that would blindly follow his commands. And pay attention to this frame. The inside of Vision's body is also made of hexagonal shape. Wanda says goodbye to Vision's body. She says, I can't feel you anymore. Which was a real heartbreaking scene to watch. Because the reason they both were together in the first place, despite the fact that one is a mutant and the other is a synthesoid robot, is because they used to feel each other. But that was well over for Wanda. Now she can't even feel that. And with all this grief, having no shoulder to cry on, what does she do? She drives to Westview, where apparently Vision had bought a land for both of them to grow old in. So she didn't steal any corpse. Hayward out and out lied about that to his team in order to frame Wanda. Now you may ask, if Wanda didn't steal Vision's corpse, then how was Hayward tracking Vision inside Westview? Well, he was tracking him through the decay signature of Vibranium. So he was probably tracking the energy coming off of Vision. We then see Herb, Jones, the mailman Dennis, and even Mrs. Hart sitting on an outside cafe table. Almost all of them kept their respective personas, even after getting hexed. Wanda then pulls over on the driveway of their future home. She sees the land that Vision had bought for them. Perhaps the groundbreaking of it all was this text from Vision, to grow old in, signed V. It's unclear whether or not this note is actually written by Vision, or if it's someone trying to manipulate Wanda into going to Westview. But either way, she's been given a map to Westview and the promise of a home. This caused Wanda's chaos magic to explode. Immediately creating her house. And notice she rewrites her reality in the shape of cubes, another reference to the comics. And if you too watch this episode at point if by big speed, you'll notice one of the advertisements on the wall transforms into a Lagos Pepper Towel advertisement that says, make cleaning a snap. So when Wanda was rewriting the reality inside this town, everything was basically from her own memories. She also creates vision literally out of nothing. That mind stone on Vision's forehead that we've been seeing so far is also a creation of Wanda. So what I think, when the Mind Stone bestowed its power upon Wanda, it might have created a backup of itself inside Wanda, knowing one day a certain someone will destroy it, and through Wanda and Vision that stone will continue living. And that is exactly what's happening. Finally, Agatha sees it all and finds out how Wanda made all of this possible. So even though Wanda doesn't realize just how powerful she is, Agatha understood immediately. It's like Agatha has a really good college degree, and Wanda is a dropout, but still Wanda is thousand times better than her. But being a dropout, she doesn't know the fundamentals of being a witch. Wanda hears the screams of the twins and runs outside of her house. Finally, she sees Agatha Harkness in her true form, who is literally torturing the twins since the beginning of this episode. Agatha says Wanda is way too dangerous. The fact that she pulled off magic in that level of significance, giving birth to the twins, recreating vision, keeping an entire town hostage, and this life-creating magic that she has is a proof that she in fact is Scarlet Witch. This is chaos magic, Wanda. And that makes you the Scarlet Witch. Oh, that name drop. Now in the meet credit scene, we see a white version of Vision resurrected using Wanda's leftover energy. This project was called Cataract, and cataracts in real life turn your eyes white. So White Vision was right in front of our eyes and we still didn't see it coming. Now in the comics, White Vision was introduced in the Vision Quest storyline. After being dismantled, Vision was rebuilt, but didn't have any of the original Vision's emotions or memories. Just like I said, this White Vision could very easily be used as a weapon by Hayward. So are we gonna see Vision vs. Vision in the final episode, and a full confrontation between Agatha Harkness and Scarlet Witch, boy, the finale is gonna be epic. And that's it. This would be my first breakdown of WandaVision's episode 8 at point two fabric speed. If you think I missed any detail, then please comment below, and I would appreciate it if you discussed the theories I came up with in this video. Now, if you like this video, then please grab some Canadian Lad merch from my official store at thecanadianlad.merchforall.com. And if you think you'd like more of these breakdowns, then please grab the subscribe button and follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Till then, I'll see you lads in the next one. Come on.